Today on Rebuilders, we are looking at the infopocalypse. We're looking at Elon Musk. We're looking at Kanye West. We're looking at Chat GPT. We're looking at deep fakes. We're looking at Saudi Arabia. We're looking at cybernetics. We're looking at at information at scale, the city of Austin, you name it. So Alex Jones. Oh, yeah, so much ground that we're covering. A great episode. If you want some uh, details of the resources that are mentioned in this episode, you can subscribe to our mailing list by heading to rebuilders.co and registering there. Let's get into it. Well, welcome to Rebuilders for our last episode of 2022. My name's Liddy and I'm here with Mark and Daniel. How are you both? Really well, thanks. How are you, Mark? I'm good. We did intend to do a few episodes the last few weeks, but didn't get there. I got COVID, but all clear now and back yes. in the back in the mm. office. We should also note that uh, we're experiencing the podcaster's dream, yes. which is when uh, men with chainsaws and a wood chipper start doing their work not far from your recording studio. So if you hear that in the background, apologies. Yeah. So we, we push on. We do. We do. Uh, so today. Yeah. You know what? I reckon, Daniel, you should start yeah, this yeah. episode. I think you've got yeah, a bit yeah. of a, an intro here. Yeah. Well, welcome uh, welcome everyone to the Rebuilders podcast hosted by Mark Sayers of Redefining, Redefine Consulting. Mark is a thought leader <laughs> and an expert on global culture, renewal, and the future of the church in the secular world. Each week, for you listeners out there, Mark brings you thought-provoking conversations with leading voices on these topics, exploring the many ways in which we can all be rebuilders in our own personal and professional lives. From entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders to everyday people making a difference in their communities, our guests share their experiences, challenges, and lessons learned as they work towards creating a better future. Join us as we delve into the complexities of rebuilding and renewal in a rapidly changing world and discover practical insights and guidance for your own journey. So let's get started with this week's episode of the Rebuilders podcast with Mark Sayers. Woo-hoo. Wow. wow. <laughs> well, that was off. I made that up all by myself. No, you didn't. How? No, no. Oh, tell us more. Tell us more. Um, what, what is that? Because it was off. I don't I don't have a consultancy firm. What was my consultancy firm <laughs> called? Redefine Consultants. And Redefined. I don't think we've ever had entrepreneurs or non-profit thought lead. What was that? Um, yeah, yeah thought- non-profit leaders to everyday people. Mm. So wherever you sit. Um, no, that was a, a generated uh, intro from chat GPT. The, For the uninitiated, what is chat it's GPT? It's an artificial intelligence chat bot um, that's been taking the world by storm and redefining homework, yeah. the, the lack of homework that people Why I'm glad I'm not teaching. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I can see moment. with such accuracy why it's, you know, taking the world by storm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was way off. I think it was. I there were some kernels of. Some, yeah, but, but it's sort of like cliche. It's like yeah. it just feels like a bunch of cliches smashed into each other and a sprinkling of untruth. Well, I guess that's kind of comforting though, right, isn't it? Yes, you know. the robots will not kill us yet, yeah. yet, yet. We've got a few years to get our weapons ready. <laughs> for, oh, for the infopocalypse. The infopocalypse, yes. Which is kind of our buzzword for today. Yes. Um, look, technically it's not infopocalypse, but if we were to pronounce it the way that um, it's actually spelt in this book that you've been reading, yeah. it just sounds a little bit. I think inappropriate for a, in for Australians, an Australian accent. Yeah, so we're not going to say because it, it sounds like we're swearing, but uh, we're going to just say infopocalypse. But uh, this is a quote from Deep Fakes and the Infopocalypse: What You Urgently Need to Know by the German Nepalese writer mm. Nina Schick. Mm. Um, she says in this: the word infopocalypse, that's my Australianism, was coined by the U.S. technologist Aviv Avadia in 2016, when he used it to warn about how bad information was overwhelming society and asking whether there's a critical threshold at which society will no longer be able to cope. The apocalypse is not a static thing or a one-off event, but rather an ever-evolving state of affairs in which we all increasingly exist. This is now Nina Schick talking. It's my contention that the infopocalypse is evolving into an ever more potent phenomenon with dangerous implications for everything from geopolitics to our individual lives. And uh, effectively, just to give a real quick definition, I think what the infopocalypse that she's talking about is, is the 
sheer scale of mm. misinformation, artificial intelligence, things like deep fakes, the ability to synthetically manipulate things at mass scale in a world that's deeply interconnected now with digital technologies like smartphones and so on. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Great. Well, you've suggested as as a starting point um, for this discussion that we look at the figure of Kanye. Yes. Kanye yeah. West. Yeah. So we'll talk about a lot of things today. It's going to be a broad-reaching conversation. Mm. And um, But I think a starting point was I think the quite remarkable, I think it was about three hours of uh, video of Kanye West on the Alex Jones show. Mm -hmm. I think everyone listening will know who Kanye West is, obviously the rapper but also fashion designer, entrepreneur, former husband of Kim Kardashian, probably one of the biggest figures in popular culture in yeah. the world uh, in the last sort of 10 years or so. And uh, he made an appearance on the uh, Alex Jones show. Again, I think a lot of people would be aware of who Alex Jones is, but Alex Jones is the host of InfoWars, mm -hmm. longtime Austin, and we're going to come back to the city of Austin, mm -hmm. uh, longtime Austin sort of uh, radio figure and so on, and you know, often I suppose would be derided as a conspiracy theorist. And Kanye made an appearance um, alongside the sort of alt-right, uh, I would call him a sort of white nationalist, uh, Nicholas Fuentes, um, uh, this was a few weeks ago, so we can hit this a few yeah. weeks ago. But um, uh, and in in the uh, episode, uh, and at, fir at first I saw a number of sound bites of it, and uh, you know they went viral on the internet. And effectively, West was first of all his appearance was quite strange. He was wearing a, a mask, like a complete mask, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, was then making a number of sort of anti-Semitic comments and um, praising Hitler and the Nazis and so on, and uh, uh, that just went absolutely viral. So mm. first of all, I think the thing that was quite shocking was someone who was at the absolute height of cultural influence and at the absolute centre of, um, you know, the elite, if you want to call it that, and... Um, you know, to see him at that space saying such radical things was, was deeply shocking. Yeah. I then watched, I didn't watch the whole three hours, but I began to watch part of it. I watched about an hour of it in context and very clearly a very unwell man. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he clearly is not in a good way. But for me, um, it's interesting. I thought about, you know, there was, there was a bit of a cliche when people looked at, figures like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin who died at 27 mm. and there was almost this thing we saw with the sort of stars who I guess lived very hedonistic drug-fueled lives that you know they got this addiction around drugs and alcohol yeah but I think what really struck me is uh, with West was you know he was talking about you know his addiction to pornography he was talking about stuff like this and and really what struck me is, is th this is someone who's almost OD'd on viral information yeah. And, you know, he was presenting, you know, a whole bunch of theories and it wasn't just, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, he's gone conservative or he's gone sort of alt-right and there's all that in there. But it was really an absolute blender of fringe theories uh, to the point where, you know, I think this is obviously a mental health crisis, but – you know, in some ways it almost felt like the information that he'd been exposed to, you know. So for, I felt it was almost like seeing someone who'd overdosed, you know. You see mm. that occasionally, you know, in the city or something, you might see someone who's, who's OD'd. But this is someone who I think had overdosed on um, information. But it's not just him, you know. We saw like, you know, uh, in January 6th, uh, you saw, you know, the, the figure Ariel Pink, you know, who is, you know, mm -hmm. again, so LA musician, you know, people sort of discovered that he'd sort of, um, his politics had changed really quickly in a quick time. Another figure would be the um, uh, British Sri Lankan artist MIA, who again, another rapper, um, but, you know, also is sort of, you know, headed into almost sort of QAnon-ish type territory, mm. you know, allegedly. Um, and, you know, you see figures like Elon Musk on Twitter. So there's this yeah. point where people are sort of like a bit struck by the rapid movement of people and this information apocalypse where it's really quickly moving people and almost this scale of information seems to be incredibly um, disruptive. And uh, we, uh, you know, just use ChatGPT, which a number of people have asked us to speak about, but this is an example, a really early example, and that was a bit off um, – uh, but, you know, you can get good hits and it's quite incredible to sort of write a question and it'll answer it really yeah, quickly. Yeah. And I think it's just a first introduction into the world that we're entering into. But uh, we also saw another 
uh, uh, thing which got our attention, which yeah, we were going to yeah. talk about two weeks ago, which we're going to bring back, which is uh, I'll let you guys introduce it, um, the uh, figure of Loeb. Oh, yeah. So uh, like AI-generated art is a thing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um the interwebs, you can just clarify when I've got things wrong here, Daniel. Um, and this image that keeps appearing of a woman, like a a, a battered woman, I suppose mm-hmm. you might say, um, it's quite a haunting figure mm. and representation. She keeps appearing um, mm. in multiple like AI-generated artworks and n- the creators can't figure out why she keeps yes. appearing and there's no sort of clear algorithms or reasons why she is appearing. It's almost – and there's sort of like references to it being yeah. supernatural or yes. something yes. like the, yes. that the digital is somehow moving into – The spiritual. The spiritual mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, space. And it is, yeah, I mean, you know, look it up at your own – Peril. Yes. I mean, um, it's really quite horrific, some of yeah, the images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even then not haunting. releasing some of the images are yes. so graphic. Yeah, and, yeah. I didn't go very far I'm down like, that. Yeah, I mean, I looked – I mean, the ones in the article, there's an article in the ABC, Australian ABC, um, about it and it's it's shocking. And, you know, I'm like, man, if that's the ones that they included, what are the ones they didn't include? But it's yeah. interesting when – so it was at first sort of created or discovered by a, a Swedish um, digital artist called Super Composite. Um, and interesting, like here's a quote, you know, like when she showed it to some people, this is a quote of how people reacted. The, f- the first strong reaction I got was that someone said I shouldn't mess with demons and that I'd be punished by God or something, um, you know, and she's sort of saying, look, there's nothing supernatural about this, but then there's literally sort of other people who are like, this is really weird. And, um, you know, f- effectively I think what it does is sort of show that we're on the precipice of something um, yeah. in, in terms of, you know, this would be an example of the info apocalypse where we're, we're unaware of where this is all sort of heading. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to try and explain, does, is there anything that we need to, from a um, uh, no, tech I think, perspective, is that a good? Yeah, no, you've explained it well. I actually haven't looked into it too much, so I've, yeah. I'm aware of her. <laughs> <laughs> But no, you've, you've done yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and we I can think, put a link yeah. to the article in the um, oh, yes. in the email, subscriber email. Yeah. Um, I think as we were discussing this a few weeks ago and I like when I looked back at um, articles, they were sort of all coming out around September. So yeah. we're um, a little bit later to this. Mm. But um, we were talking about both Kanye and this Loeb character and in a way – Kanye is Loeb. Yes, like yes. He, 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 the state that he is in at the mm. moment is this weird um, uh, result of mm. all of this mishmash of, mm. of ideas and information and excess that somehow mm. results in, in mayhem and chaos mm. um, at a real meta level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a really good way of putting it. There's something like it was something so shocking. So, it's, I mean, Alex Jones is often derided, you know, as a complete nutter and, mm. you know, there's gifts of him saying the most craziest things. But it was shocking to see Alex Jones' face through a lot of the interview where you're like, Alex Jones is like, this is going too far. I don't know what to do with this guy. Yeah. You know, and so for Kanye West to be, really so extreme that Alex Jones doesn't even know what to do with him, you know, is similar to Loeb. In some ways, like what is being – this? it's almost like both Loeb and um, – and it's so weird that we're talking about a digital entity <laughs> as a personal. It's really creepy. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the first thing I said, this is, I think as a Christian and I saw Loeb, there's a spiritual sense around it. And even the sort of Kanye thing, there's a spiritual sense I get around these things that we're seeing something here which is heading into interesting territory. Not interesting, it's probably too – mundane a word but Mm. disturbing territory and you know i think that people are not prepared for where things are about to go um and uh they're reflecting back almost the darkness of the internet so Loeb is yeah yeah i mean to to try and notice that Loeb is a woman she looks the same in all the pictures there's various versions of her but you can recognize the same woman it's a woman who looks like she's been beaten yes some it is horrifically beaten and she's like i mean i don't carrying body parts and is it horrific and almost is it some sort of reflection of the horror that is on the internet and yeah yeah and west comes on these shows and to see someone go from 
you know, being on the Academy Awards and, mm. you know, married to Kim Kardashian is probably, you know, another emblematic popular culture figure to be in this place. It's, it's, you're right. It's a ref- they're almost canaries in the mines. They're like ciphers re- reflecting back to us something deeper and darker that's happening. Yeah. Well, um, I, th- I feel like that that is a, a helpful starting point. Let's take a step back and look at what are the kind of contours of the info apocalypse. Mm. Well, the first one I'm going to start with is yeah. a movie, which Go is really on. interesting. So, so okay, so just to preface this, um, I watched recently again, and I'll tell you years ago, the movie Slacker, which I think is 1991. It's an independent film by Richard Linklater who did Days Think and Feuds and – uh, a number of other films. Uh, Slacker was, his, I think, his first feature set in Austin. We're back in Austin, mm-hmm. home of Alex Jones. And really what it is, it's it's a movie set around the alternative subculture of sort of early 90s, Gen X, Austin, uh, yeah. And it doesn't follow one character. It's like begins with Richard Linklater, Linklater acts himself and he gets off a bus and he's just talking and he's sort of like just almost – talking his internal monologue out loud and then he bumps into another character and that character speaks and then you bump into another character. So there's not one major character, it's just all these different characters. But you go on this journey, but the first thing that struck me is it's all these people who are not, they're talking but they're not conversing. They're almost broadcasting. They're just speaking out their inner life. Some of it's about how people feel about their inner world. Others are talking about conspiracy theories, JFK, medical uh, conspiracy theories, Um, Others are talking about like radical left-wing politics. Others are talking about, you know, trying to meet a girl here. Mm. Others are talking about, um, you know, libertarianism. And and even even interestingly, like there's one bit where they're walking through Austin and you see a Ron Paul uh, science truck. Ron Paul is uh, one of the sort of early old school libertarians in the American political scene. Okay. uh, Which is an interesting sort of foretaste of where things go. Um, there's another one where they go into this room and there's this guy who's got all these videotapes and he's like trying to keep all these like like meme bits of video and people are like he's he's got a video that a, a mass shooter like filmed of himself before he he went and did his mass shooting mm. and he says it's really interesting the guy's got like his room filled with video screens he's actually got a video he's got a, he got a, a, a um a TV and a video player strapped strapped onto him like a backpack. And he's like, oh, you know, and the guy's like, why are you capturing all this sort of thing? And he's mm. like, I'm, I'm, I was out recently and I saw a guy get stabbed and I felt it was this sort of tragedy that I wasn't able to record it because I can't remember it. I wish I could have recorded it at that moment. And so watching Slacker, it just hit me the other day that uh, Susanna Zuboff in her book, The Age of Digital Surveillance, talks about that in some ways social media came along and it answered a problem that was already in the culture, that people were becoming more disconnected. They wanted a new form of community. And so almost like the internet didn't create the isolation, the internet was responding to the isolation that was already existing mm-hmm. in society. And seeing Slacker, it made me realize that that really, in, sen- in a sense, these things that people are complaining about now, like the rise of conspiracy theories and, you know, oh, there's the rise of a new hard left or a rise of a new sort of radical libertarian right, all these things were already in play in places like Austin yes. um, before the internet. And even the ways that the characters are talking, they're broadcasting and the internet then becomes this structure to just facilitate that at scale. Yes. Even the guy who's like wanting video, like that happens. We all now have what he desired in that scene to be able to film, yes. you know. Yep. And interesting, the final scene of the movie, that it's just this sort of like bit where they're just a group of young adults sort of filming themselves. They go to the top of this hill and the last scene of the movie is he throws this sort of Super 8 camera into the air and it starts spinning. And in some ways, I almost felt like that's what's happened. That camera now has been released into the world, that mm. ability to broadcast, to record, to, you know, talk about your conspiracy theory. There's one bit where the girl goes, a girl goes into the library and she bumps into this guy who's a big JFK guy and he's just talking at her and he's like trying to get a book published. He can now publish that on the internet, you yeah, know what I mean, yeah. at, at scale. So in some ways, I feel like part of what has happened is that sort of alternative American subculture that began to grow up in the 80s and the 90s just went on mass scale and became mainstream is is partially what's sort of been going on uh, that's so, so so it doesn't this doesn't just begin with technology yeah fascinating um well you have a you have a series of sort of headings that we're going to work yeah. our way through so slacker was the first one uh the second one is the blender yes the blender okay so 
You've got all these different sort of structure and subcultures and fan groups and this sort of reaction against the sort of mainstream, you know, I guess mass media that you saw in the 60s, 70s and 80s and Reaganism and so on that you see in America. That gets then, you know, that's really the culture out of which a lot of the internet sort of emerges in yes. California and connects people in Austin. So it connects those sort of communities which previously were in-person communities or perhaps mm -hmm. had a fanzine or something. Yes. Um, but it's interesting thinking about like, Kanye West, when Kanye West, you know, went on his anti-Semitic rants and totally understandably what it does is it raises ghosts of the past. You know, people fear mm. about um, the Holocaust. People fear about the return of Nazism and and you look at a lot of people on the left are deeply afraid of the return of fascism or Nazism. A lot mm. of people on the right are deeply afraid of the return of communism or Stalinism. And in many ways, we've got this backwards look. You know, we yeah, look yeah. to the bas back and we're, the, the past, and we've talked about this before. But what I realize is I think what, what the big thing I'm trying to communicate or we're trying to communicate today is we're not going to go back. We're not going to go to the mass mobilization culture of Nazism. The only really true sort of proper or comparable communist state in the world that you would, you would talk about is – is North Korea, where mm -hmm. they don't have the internet. You know, currently Cuba has a significant protest movement happening. Um, we're looking at what's happening in Iran at the moment. Uh, even China, which so many people fear as a mass surveillance state. Um, you know, we talked last time about, you know, this sort of doubling down on yeah. COVID zero. But what's happened since then is that there was some protests kicked off and not even huge protests. I think mm. we talked about last time. And, you know, the government has reversed, you know, it, its rules very quickly. So in a sense, I don't think we're heading back to those things. Are those thought trains still there? Is anti-Semitism still there and racism? One hundred percent. I'm not saying any of that's not there. And are there fascists and communists and people want to push that stuff still around? One hundred percent. But what you see with with Kanye West is something. I think this is different. It's 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 a kind of blender where all these ideas get blended in together. Yes. So in a sense, he is he is repeating. Um, you know, sort of stuff from the the alt right. He's repeating stuff from the far right. He's just repeating repeating sort of con Clinton conspiracy theories. He's repeating QAnon conspiracy theories. But then he's also you know repeating other sort of you know fringe thoughts from you know groups uh, you know like the Black Hebrew Israelites, who mm. you know are sort of a, a, a very fringe group, um, but believe that sort of African Americans and some of them believe that um, Indigenous Americans are actually the true uh, Jewish people. Really weirdly, we recently had a terrible um, police shooting in in, in yeah. Queensland here yeah. in Australia, um, and um, two police officers and, and an innocent third person were shot by uh, sort of people who sort of come out of the freedom movement again, who were sort of seemingly leading quite normal jobs as a school principal and school teacher, and then they basically ambushed the police and you know come out of that freedom movement, gone deeper into radicalization and the internet. Interestingly, watching the, some of their videos came to light and people sort of classified them as sort of, you know, Christians or whatever. But actually, if you listen to some of the language, and these these were, you know, Anglo-Australians, they were using some of the terms from actually that is used in, in communities of black Hebrew Israelites. So yeah. what you see is these terms are going around and going into the internet. And in the past, they would stay in these little subcultures, but now they're all mixing together. And the mm. fact that this, this couple was sort of in conversation with a, an American internet personality who was – you know, sort of a, a off the grid somewhere. You've got these people off the grid but are still communicating by the internet with each other. Yeah. Shows you that what we're seeing is that the future is this complete mash of hybrids. Uh, you know, it's it's not this binary thing. And that's why we're talking a lot about that. You know, we talk a lot about polarization, but polarization is moving towards fragmentation. Yes. So I think what 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 the Kanye West thing is, what Loeb is, is no one, I think, is thinking about where we're going. We're just still terrified by the past, but we need to be aware that we're moving into something very new and very different that I don't think we've really experienced it before, which is facilitated by technology that is super invasive at such an incredible scale and volume. Mm. You know, like, and that's where I go back to like, how many YouTube videos has Kanye West watched? you know, yeah. um, that has got him to this place. Um, and, and that's why I think we need to understand that, yes, we need to be worried about ideologies of the past coming back that are dangerous, but really where we're going is the blender. Yes. And I think, uh, to be fair, it's not surprising that we 
are inclined to fear those things from yes. the past. It is a paradigm yes. which we understand. It's a reference totally. point that we have. Um, yeah, so it's it's hard to uh, envisage what what could be. But, you know, then you start seeing these, uh, like you think about Loeb and what Loeb mm. kind of represents and you see this horrific figure and you don't know how to yeah. approach it. That's what's ahead. Yes, it's almost more primal. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the political, you know, we've talked before about the sort of new right and we've talked before about mm. critical theory and these things. I mean, critical theory really grows up in reaction to fascism, you know, mm. and a bunch of intellectuals who have lived through fascism, many have had to escape Europe and end up places like the United States who were trying to work out what on earth just happened. Um, and a lot of the thought on the conservative side were people, a lot of people who had escaped communism and yeah. were trying to work out what on earth happened there. So a lot of our political imagination is shaped by people who were trying to understand totalitarianism mm. of both left and right streams in a previous era but I think where we're – and those – because it's the blender, those things are going to be in the future. Yes. Remixed and, and chopped up and reinvented. But where we're heading I think is something very new. Mm. Well, the next uh, point that you've got here is is the public square. Yeah. So I think what we're getting is this, this colliding between the reality of the blender and this sort of technology at scale. And then this idea we've got of the public square. Mm. So the public square is an idea that you can go back to, you know, see Paul in Athens goes to mm -hmm. Areopagus and there's people like sharing ideas in this public space and city planning and you've got these ideas that even come from, you know, Plato and Aristotle of the sort of people of the city coming, you know, politics comes from polis, city, public life. Yes. Um, you know, and that goes all through sort of particularly Western culture, this, this space where you should be able to contest ideas and ideas around free speech and so on. Um, you know, that's very much in this a liberal democratic movement. Um, and it's interesting, you know, this, this, this in at Berkeley in the 1960s, there was the big free speech movement, which was part of the countercultural movement. But, uh, you know, I think of Elon Musk, who, who recent takeover of the public square, mm. uh, as he called it, of Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know, he felt that if we're going to move forward as a culture, we need to have a kind of public square. And his argument is that Twitter is the public square of the 21st century global culture. But it's so fascinating him sort of pushing back on the previous incarnation of Twitter and yeah. the sort of uh, leadership of Jack Dorsey. And he sort of comes in and he's trying to reinterpret this and he's like he calls himself a free speech abs absolutist. Uh, but all of a sudden he's starting to ban people and, yes. you know, is looking at what do you do with certain information. And he's realising, you know, this clash. And I would say it's a clash between <coughs> – pardon me – a clash between – the vision that many people have, even both on the left and the right, that there, mm. there should be still be some place for civil engagement and dialogue. There's that. And then there's the reality of the blender. <laughs> yes. And and the tensions between those two things are just absolutely fascinating. And and what we're seeing is I think is that, you know, we live in a world where these spaces are not as as free as we think. It's mm. interesting seeing how one of the big sort of conservative critiques of things like Twitter was that, well, they're run by liberal elites and they're banning conservatives. Now, Musk is in and he's sort of a libertarian and he's now banning left-wing, you know, liberal liberal journalists. Yeah. But then there's all the stuff behind this as well. You know, a lot of the funding um, comes from uh, Twitter. It's actually from Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And in, I think it's 2015, there were two, I think, Twitter employees that were unmasked as Saudi intelligence uh, officers or assets. Um, and so in many ways, what you see is these spaces. There's two things going on. There's the blender, but then we've also got this geopolitical battle as well yeah. uh, where you've got um, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia who are trying to get hold of these things. You've got Russian disinformation, Chinese disinformation, Iranian disinformation. I was reading today about Thai. Even the Thai uh, government is now doing disinformation. Yeah. But then interestingly today, just as we sort of are recording this, you know, you've got the Twitter files. Uh, so Musk is releasing information from the sort of back channels of, of Twitter and the journalist Lee Fang from The Intercept has just released a uh, you know, big sort of article today and he's been deep diving into the sort of Twitter files, yeah. you know, which is that the Pentagon was using Twitter as a form of influence and social engineering. <laughs> yeah, and, wow. you know, there's a lot of critique of Russia of using sort of fake humans to write these articles that the long and short of this is everyone's doing this. So it's the structure of the internet, the scale of the internet, but also we, we increasingly live in this 
geopolitical battle. And I think that's where the quote of Nina Schick that I read at the beginning is, this is affecting mm. individual lives. It's affecting things at a geopolitical level. So are you saying that the public square n- no longer exists? Well, one of the one of the visions and changes in the world that happened. So you've got this very much this liberal Western uh, uh, tradition, which is mm-hmm. built a lot around building institutions, and you can trace a lot of you know the Western Anglo political tradition back to the English Civil War, in the 1600s, where out of the crisis of that, you had you know the division of Parliament and the Crown and all these different things, and, and many of the things like rule of law and constitutions and all these things that we've we've integrated. You have these institutions. But then what happens is in the in the wake of World War II, there's this sort of other stream of thought that begins to emerge. And there's a series of conferences um, that are held um, by Macy's, the Macy's uh, family, who have the yeah, Macy's right. department okay. stores. Yep. And this is a gathering of intellectuals who are really captured by a new kind of idea of understanding the world. And it's called they call it cybernetics. The yeah, okay. scientist Norbert Weiner. Um, begins to talk in this way and there's, I think it's Roland Ashby, the British guy, and there's Margaret Mead's there and, you know, Gregory Bateson. And and really what this is is looking at the world as more of a system Mm -hmm. and seeing a blend between the human and the machine, the breaking down of binaries and a world where everything sort of is more flatter, you have less Mm -hmm. hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And in many ways this is the world out of which the internet emerges. Yeah. You've got a figure like um, is it Stuart Brand who was writing the Whole Earth Catalogue, which was sort of this hippie scrapbook that they used to publish about how you can make your own geodesic uh, dome home <laughs> to, you know, how you can sort of do organic vegetables and all this sort of stuff. So they have this book and they reprint it. So, again, this is an example of like the internet existed before the internet. Yeah. Um, you've got this sort of nascent uh, 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 Stuart Brand uh, connects with Jed, uh, Gregory Bateson, who's one of the real fathers of the New Age movement. So, again, it's a this is where we're not religious because religious seems like it's more hierarchical and established. Yes. And Bateson's more spirituality. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So there's very much this sort of California and flattening of the world, the world is a system. And this idea doesn't just get picked up by hippies. It gets picked up by like people like the Rand Corporation Mm -hmm. and, Mm. you know, you begin to see this being grabbed on by even by the Pentagon. And it's this idea that the word cyber comes from this ancient Greek word meaning helmsman. How do you steer a system? Yes. So instead of like how do you rule from the top, how do you steer the system where you want to go? But this is a contrast in a sense to the idea of the public square and Mm -hmm. institutions which enable us to then have public square conversations. Yes. And so you see this sort of battleground or two different visions. The world is a system. And this goes back to our very first, I think, series of the networked world. Yeah, yeah. This is where you see these networked ideas come into the culture. And I think what we're seeing now is this sort of that that story now being applied at absolute scale where the point it almost becomes sort of incoherent. Okay. So in – can I just ask, like yeah. in reference to uh, – the public square, and mm. also what you've said about cybernetics. In these settings, do the most powerful voices have the most power? Like, yeah. Great question. I would say that the most powerful voices have the most power, but the nature of power has changed. <laughs> so power- well, There's a riddle for you. Well, the power, okay, so in a centralised- um, and again, too, we're going back to some of the themes I talk about in non anxious presence here. Yeah. You've got times when you've got centralized authorities and they're yeah. the most powerful voices. But moving to a more cybernetic, more network state of affairs mean you have to use power differently. Yes. This is why you've effectively got information warfare everywhere now. Yes. Because um, power shifts all the time. Yes, yes. Yes. So so that's what's happening. So we're seeing the world is changing because we're seeing a profound shift in how power operates. Yeah. So you look at Joe Rogan. Is incredibly powerful now. Yep. You know, he's just what was an MNMA announcer, uh, but he has the world's biggest podcast, and he can get someone on to talk about their their view on vaccines, mm. and millions of people around the world will uh, jump onto that. Now, is yes. he he would be more powerful globally than say probably I don't know a large government department in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Where in the previous year, or he may be, you know, he may be more powerful than many countries in some way. Not that mm-hmm. he doesn't have an army or a GDP, but in terms of how power operates in this flattened network cybernetic world, yeah. in, you know, sort of inputs into the um, 
into that world will have this tremendous um, influence. So, so the the powerful are still operating, but I think what it's happening is you're seeing. So, for example, China, Russia was a master of disinformation early on. Yeah, and I think the West has also been been active is what we've learned. China wasn't as much so, but now it's getting on board. So mm-hmm. everyone's learning to play the rules of this game. And I think the Twitter file revelation today probably was the US government going, well, Russia's doing it, we're going to have to do it back. Yeah. So all of a sudden everyone's learning, or maybe they did it first, who knows. You know, everyone's learning to play the rules now of this new environment, this new grey zone environment in which we're entering into. Yeah, so it's n- it's no longer the the logic of a discussion in the public square. Yes, yes. It's every man for himself. Yes. Yeah, which kind of leads to this next point, um, social scissors, this concept of social scissors. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, the – the um, uh, oh, I've gone blank on his name. Uh, the blogger, Slate Star Codex, um, who I think was Dox, then his real name is Scott Alexander, who is sort of a Bay Area, sort of uh, wrote on tech and different things. Um, you know, he talked about this idea of scissors that almost you could create through technology, through finding like, like okay, g- go back one step, like print journalism changed when people began to come up with kinds of headlines that made you want to click you yeah. know, on them. Yeah. And- this is that concept taken to a new kind of high where there's almost the internet's almost creating these issues which people will ultimately fragment over and there's no middle ground to take on them. Yeah. So, for example, like, lock, you know, like um, uh, almost every week there seems to be a new kind of culture war issue that emerges. In the last week it's been the Harry, Harry, Megan documentary on Netflix. Yep. There's very few people that have, you know, an, like an ambivalent view on that. Mm. The world is increasingly um, uh, populated in our sort of cybernetic world by issues which fragment coalition. So often institutions are rebuilt after times of chaos through creating coalitions. Most political parties, actually not everyone who agrees the same, but coalitions of people who come together for a bigger thing. Nations Mm -hmm. are coalitions of people who come together. This very flat cybernetic world that we're in is more defined by scissors. So scissors cut you in in half. And and John Stokes wrote an article, he's another sort of tech blogger, wrote an article on on this concept of scissors saying something like, you've now got these extreme ones, particularly around sex, like there's the drag queen story hour. You know, should should children be able to go to drag queen strip shows is something that very few people are gonna be like, look, I'm ambivalent. Like it gets a, it, a very strong reaction you. either way. Yes. So and that's very much one of the big sort of culture war issues in America at the moment uh, to the point where recently there was a number of attacks upon the, I don't know if it's Ohio, I think it was, um, Daniel can fact check, um, attacks on the power grid in an American state. You know, and people were speculating, are people doing this to stop these, these uh, sort of strip shows? Um, so what you're seeing is the sort of the way that our public discourse is happening in the new cybernetic reality yeah. of the sort of info apocalypse is just driving and radicalizing and creating more fragmentation at an incredibly rapid rate. Yeah, and we've kind of talked about that before in terms of uh, what we've seen happening on the right and the left. Yes. Not that there's necessarily those distinct binaries anymore but people becoming yes. further down that spectrum yes, yes. and more radical. I mean, I think, I think we talked about the World Cup um, in our last episode, which is just finished, and congratulations to Argentina. And mm-hmm. um, But you saw that continue, that trend. So you, you had the sort of from Western Europe, this pushback against Qatar's um, uh, sort of, you know, worker rights stuff and LGBT, LGBTQI sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But then you had this massive push, which grew and grew towards pro-Palestinian. So, like, yeah, it was okay. it was hardly covered in the Western media, but after most games, the Muslim teams were, like, holding up Palestinian flags. And Morocco, which won this fantastic run, uh, were making this real point to carry the Palestinian flag alongside the Moroccan flag. Mm. And interestingly, what happened was, because of the initial pushback from the West, almost the whole Islamic world was getting behind every Muslim team 
uh, you know, or like if it was Qatar or Saudi, whoever was playing. So you begin to began to see that that classic sort of public square that the World Cup was where yes. you, you just go for your country yeah. began to change and you saw these cultural war issues happening. Yeah. You know, and then you had, I think it was there was some woman from like Croatia who was like, I'm just going to rock up and walk around in skimpy outfits and that was, you know, offensive. And, you know, like yeah. the, the people in the past would sort of go and look, oh, okay, I'm in this sort of neutral space. I'll respect the rules and we'll sort of put politics aside so we can have a World Cup. You're seeing that falling down. Yes. You know, and I think I said just wait till – North America World Cup next time, uh, that's just going to be 10 times bigger. Yeah. Oh, that'll be fascinating. So scissors, scissors, Palestine is a scissor. Yes. Do you know what okay. I mean? Yes. Um, LGBTQI rights are a scissor for the world. Workers' rights, scissor, you know, whether a, a woman should be able to rock in a skimmy outfit at the World Cup, scissor. All these are in an Islamic environment. These are all scissors. Yeah. Even, even when, when Argentina won, the Qataris um, gave Lionel Messi – uh, when he picked up the trophy, this this traditional uh, sort of garment, they said it was the the bisht, which I think is pronounced, which is the sort of this this like a, it's like a coat, um, which is given to people of honor. Mm-hmm. Within seconds, that became a scissor, you know. So like, yeah, oh, okay. this is the Qataris, they're, they're they're sports washing. Or then another one was like alt right people, like, oh, they're putting this Islamic thing on him. They're trying to. And then football purists, you know, they should just let him wear his Argentina shirt. And, yeah, then, okay. and then there was this massive pushback in the Muslim world. No, this is the Muslim world showing hospitality and just instant everything becomes a scissor. Like, yes. like um, Kylian Mbappe, the French player who's got a hat-trick in the final, was hugged by Macron, mm. French president. And then people were saying, oh, this is, this is racism. The way he hugged him was paternalistic. Yeah, just wow. like every single thing becomes an instant scissor. That's the new social structure. Yeah, wow. Well, final point for the contours of the infopocalypse, from inclusivity to exclusivity. Well, I'm, I'm going to apologise because there's a lot of football examples tonight, today, and actually I'm not going to apologise. Yeah, I'm like, no. um, <laughs> so So the world that has grown up, over the last little while, one of the buzzwords has been inclusivity, which is understandable because we've had a period where there's been lots of people and and, and who've not had have felt marginalized out of mainstream society. Mm. But there's this really interesting shift that begins to happen as we go into the infopocalypse, where <coughs> what we've learned in the last season of just ever increasing inclusivity, that begins to change. So let me just give you an example. Uh, a few days ago here in Australia, uh we had our first sort of round of football matches after the World Cup and uh, Melbourne Victory uh, were playing Melbourne City, which is the local derby here in Melbourne, and there's a pitch invasion and uh, Melbourne Victory fans, um, in full disclosure, of which I am one myself, um, uh, ran on the field and assaulted the goalkeeper in, in a protest against something the governing body was doing. Just so to clarify, was- you were, you didn't participate in that. You're a Melbourne Victory supporter, but you didn't participate. I had COVID. I yeah. had an alibi. <laughs> I was at home with COVID. I actually would have been in the game if I didn't had if I hadn't have had COVID. Anyway, but I wasn't there. Just to clarify for all <laughs> yeah. Victoria Police officers listening. Um, so, uh, long story short, bunch of football hooligans run on the pitch, assaulted the goalkeeper, assaulted the referee, assaulted some security, broke the goals, everything. Now, interestingly, the public. The public, um, the, the, the head of football in Australia comes out and he makes this statement. And I think this is really interesting in this current understanding of this moment. Mm-hmm. He says, um, football in Australia is the most inclusive sport. If you look at the Australian national football team, the soccer is at the last World Cup, incredibly the most representative and most inclusive team in Australia with different ethnic groups and different cultural backgrounds. We are an inclusive sport. So he kept saying, we are inclusive, we are inclusive, we are inclusive. So that's why we must weed out these supporters and <laughs> we must kick them out of our game and they have no place. They are not football fans. They're not here for football and they must go. Mm. And it just struck me and it was a little sort of vignette which captured a problem I think with where we're going that our answer rightly and it is still the answer in many things, I want to just make that clear, that inclusivity is, is a really important thing. But if you just take a value of inclusivity into the Apoc- infopocalypse yeah. where the problem is everything all at once and too much stuff and where in your football – so part of the issue that was then discovered in the days after that 
particular little riot at the football game in Melbourne is that, you know, there was a part of the fan group who aligned themselves with far right football hooligan firms in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now they're saying they don't want them. So actually what the the head of football Australia was saying was um, inclusivity, inclusivity, inclusivity. But what he was really saying was exclusivity, exclusivity, exclusivity. We don't want those people. Yeah. So in a, in a world of infopocalypse, it's more important who you're saying is not part of this than who is in. Elon yes. Musk now is trying to define instantly before he was head of Twitter. He's like, I'm a free speech absolutist. As soon as he's running Twitter, he now has to decide what information will not be allowed on Twitter, yeah. who will not be allowed on Twitter. So as things become more cybernetic, as things become more networked, as things become more, and again, too, cybernetic was all about breaking down binaries between humans, between human and, and machine, between hierarchies and who's at the top and who's at the bottom. In that world, uh, the questions are going to shift more from inclusivity to exclusivity because without those boundaries, everything becomes extremely toxic very quickly. Mm. You know, so you, the, the, the language with Elon Musk is not, well, he should listen to more stuff. It's like you should not be listening to that stuff. Or yes. Elon Musk, uh, sorry, not Elon Musk, uh, Kanye, Kanye West. Yeah. Kanye West now needs to be cancelled. That's not inclusive language. That's exclusive language. Yeah. So I think the way we're heading more is it's not like, yes, inclusivity is great. But the questions of exclusivity, what we're not going to tolerate becomes more key in, in this new environment. Yeah, okay. Well, with all of that, uh, I guess, context of the info apocalypse, um, what, what, how do we as the church, as leaders um, in the global church, uh, as part of the global church, um, approach this, you know, um, do we do we fear the appearance of lobe at every corner? Yes. Um, you know, like <laughs> yeah, it, it, because that's going to appear. How do we how do we approach this? And um, you've got some sort of three provocative ways to think about this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing is um, Darren Achamoglu and James Robinson in their book Why Nations Fail talk about the fact that our most healthy institutions and enduring institutions which provide social flourishing tend to emerge not when a group of people get together with the whiteboard and say, hey, let's think of a great, healthy, flourishing institution. They tend to emerge out of absolute crisis. Mm. And I think we're heading into a crisis and, um, of the info apocalypse. Mm. And the institutions which were often formed and built for purpose in the previous season um, – Either we'll have to change or we need to build new kinds of institutions to deal with this new reality. Mm -hmm. And so, again, we've talked in previous weeks about adaptive versus technical solutions. Yep. Technical solution is so do A, B, C, and D. Adaptive tend to be, I don't know where we're going, but we're going to come up with something. Let's all go together and come up with a better solution. This is yep. 100% an adaptive solution. We do not have a technical solution for, for Loeb. Um, yeah. uh, but I think that what we need to do is we need people to start thinking creatively mm -hmm. and realise that how church shapes itself, how discipleship shapes itself, how we help the broader community outside of the church build healthy institutions going forward. And institutions are a really broad definition of that. It's anything that humans come together to do with a goal for flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to build new ones for the new environment that is coming. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I think we've talked about before that a lot of the church structures that we we know from the idea of small groups to parachurch organizations to the shapes of church, a lot of that emerged as new institutions that Christians built in the social upheavals that followed the 1600s and into the globalization and modernity that began in the 17, in the 18th century. Yeah. Um, we need to realize that is the task before us. Um, and so I'm optimistic because this is the exact kind of cultural crucible um, out of which new and exciting and cut through institutions are going to emerge. But we need to put our creative hats on and our adaptive leadership hats on and realize that that's what it's going to be, not just more of the same stuff and expecting different results. Yeah, great. Um, your second point. <sighs> Is from, yeah. from formation to radicalization. Okay, so I think that you know I've been big on 
you know, talking a lot over the last few years about how we're being formed very slowly and and deliberately by social media and mm. um, how towards, you know, I've talked a lot over the last 10, 15 years around consumerism and individualism and how that's we're being shaped by that every single day yeah. by you know, increasingly, by, I talked a lot about advertising, but then it became advertising in digital form and, and s- smartphones and so on. That's still happening. But I think where we're moving increasingly in infopocalypse is, is less that people are being formed is what you see with Kanye West is radicalization. Yes. And, you know, there's a lot of talk when ISIS came on the scene to 2015, 2016 of online radicalization with in terms of Islamic jihadist terrorists. But I think when you see Kanye West and you see so much other things happening in society is radicalization is happening everywhere. It's happening on mm. the left. It's happening on the right. I think COVID and the extra screens that people, you know, ingested and the social isolation that happened during that time was really a, 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 a period of accelerated radicalization. Sure. And, you know, I, I think that we need to have a more robust approach again I don't have a technical solution just yet. This is more framing how we need to think about the next phase. I think it's just that, hey, you're being slowly formed and you sort of just got to go on a long obedience in the right direction. I still believe that and that's the the Eugene Peterson line. Mm. But I almost feel that there's something more – what's the word? There's almost a more proactiveness that we need to go. You're not just stopping slow formation. You're now stopping very quick radicalization. Um, yeah, it's not it's not a, a frog in a slowly yes, boiling pot of yes, water. Yes, it's, it's a frog in in the flames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thirdly, the third one. Yes, yes, plausibility <laughs> structures. Okay, so the we one, have- the one, the one really interesting um, thing that I. I think that is going to happen. So in a sense, so much of what we're talking about is absolutely terrifying. Um, and um, Loeb is particularly terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I think a Loeb just as a concept but also the the kind of meta-reality around it. Yes, yes. And, and, and when you see Loeb, you begin to realise that I think the world that we're possibly heading into is very different than the one that we've been in. There's something so visceral when you see a picture of Loeb, when you read about it, it creeps you out. Mm. Uh, Charles Williams, um, who's part of the Inklings, um, you know, wrote a number of – oh, what, you know what? So he's friends with C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and he wrote a number of sort of novels and you'd almost sort of call them supernatural novels. And it was almost his way at that time of sort of high modernity of trying to connect people back to this concept of the supernatural. Mm. And you can also see Lewis was doing something similar with his sort of myth-making of, of yeah. Narnia yeah. and Dan Tolkien as well. Um, and I think they were onto something there. In a sense, they were trying to get people to think in that way. And I wonder too whether the sort of high modernism and high rationalism um, uh, is actually going to start to fall down at a rapid rate. Uh, you know, I think I, I, I might have mentioned on the on on this uh, podcast a little while ago that I'd, I'd watched a few of the old episodes of X Files, yeah, um, which I remember in the '90s was this sort of sense of hey, we're, when that came out, people were saying, oh, we're, we're in this rationalist world now. We're moving back into these sort of supernatural themes, yeah. And I think there's actually a kind of return to what we're going to see is that one of the sort of interesting things of cybernetics is that one of the things that Norbert Weiner and these people were doing was they were sort of also trying to remove the binary between the machine and the magical. Yeah, okay. And I think there's this sense that you're going to start to see a return of the supernatural as you have this sort of consensual reality collapse in the infopocalypse. I think the plausibility structures that people have had around, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to believe in faith because I'm in the mainstream and we're the secular mainstream. I think that's falling down rapidly. You know, you're seeing this tremendous return to all kinds of neo-paganism and mm. spiritualities and and idol idolatries. That's always been there, but it's becoming much more clearer. So hear me right, I'm not celebrating a return to those things, but there's a sense when those things return, there's also an openness to the spiritual. Yes. And I think we're seeing that. You know, you saw movements like the Jesus people grow during the time of the counterculture and the hippie, you know, and on, on New, I think it was Newport Beach or wherever, you know, these people were coming to faith alongside other people becoming Hare Krishnas. I think we're, we're moving again to something like that yeah. where I think that the plausibility structures – 
of the sort of modernist rationalist world are falling down. You know, the postmodernism has spoken about a while for the fact that they're sort of falling down, but we're now just seeing it at a rapid scale that I think the acceleration of that could incredibly can move. So in a sense, what we're seeing too is everything, you know, they've often had this thing where people are, I think in the last couple of decades, particularly younger people have been unwilling to or uncomfortable about evangelizing or proselytizing because it feels like I don't want to push my values on everyone else. We're now moving to a place where everyone is pushing their values on everyone else. Every, everyone's doing evangelism of some kind of their yeah. particular worldview. So everything becomes evangelism. I think we've said it before. I think we're returning to what Newbegin said of a much more first century reality. Yeah, It's going to be more like, you know, the Arapagus with different people yelling at each other from different, you know, <laughs> things and Paul speak preaching in Athens. I, I think we're, we're moving to a space that's much more like that. And I think the West is going to sort of return into a kind of sort of neo-paganism. Yeah. Well, uh, how do how do we hold that as the church? I think we see the opportunity in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think that there's a tre- there's going to be a tremendous evangelistic opportunity because as reality collapse happens, people's openness, I think, to to hearing new stories, to exploring what is the meaning of life, as as the existential questions come up, I think we need to be ready for the evangelistic opportunity. I think is coming our way. Yeah. Well, let's be praying. Let's be churches that begin with prayer, um, believing that God will provide opportunities for Mm. us to be his hands and feet Mm. um, as we encounter this stuff. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Anything you want to say? Oh, yeah, please. Well, I just was going to add to like infopocalypse comes from the word apocalypse. Yeah. And apocalypse comes from the Greek word for revealing. Yeah. It's actually not the end of the world. And it's actually when, you know, you think of that term in, in Revelation, it's actually a pulling back and people seeing the, the kingdom of God as it truly is, yeah. upside down kingdom as it really is, that the the powers of the world are humiliated. And I think that's the prayer, that yeah. in the midst of the infopocalypse, that that people will have an apocalypse of Jesus as the king above all, mm. um, which is the message of Christmas. Yeah that the skies were opened above the shepherds, uh, these people on the, the edge of society, mm. and uh, I think Chesterton talked about that, you know, the people sort of further. And I think he talked about almost like the, the shepherds were the ones who were furthest almost away from the temple and almost were the most likely to fall for things like neo-paganism and stuff in, or paganism in that day. And they get these incredible revelations, the, the sort of curtains pulled back, see the full heavenly host, heaven comes close to earth. And, you know, in that manger, in a really upside down way, the kingdom is revealed and the king is revealed. Yes. I think that's our hope that yeah. there'll be more shepherds who have revelations as the curtain is pulled back in the mm. next era. Happy Christmas. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Liddy. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. See you next year. Yeah. 2023.